Puppets. They've captured our hearts and imagination for generations. These moving sculptures have the ability to make us laugh, cry, and conjure up a whole range of human emotions. Well, that's what the art of puppetry is all about. Unlike any other art form, puppetry has the capacity to breathe life into inanimate objects and make us believe in a pretend world. For centuries, puppets have been a favorite form of American entertainment. This magical medium called puppetry has grown and changed dramatically over the past 300 years. What is the American puppet? Where did the American puppet tradition begin? And who and what influenced puppetry in America? Join us on a journey of wonder as we chronicle puppetry's fascinating and colorful evolution. This is the story of the American puppet. The tradition of American puppetry begins with the settling of the New World. The early puppeteers were itinerant showmen from England, France, and Germany, who brought with them various forms of puppetry from their native lands. It is here that the American puppet tradition took root. Colonial puppeteers traveled from town to town, finding work at fairs, taverns, and on city streets. One of the more popular types of puppets found on the street corners of colonial America were peddler dolls, or street puppets. They were hinged wooden dolls on strings that danced in time to music played by the traveling showmen. Upon entering a town, these showmen would advertise their puppet exhibition using horns, bells, or speaking trumpets. Yeah, brother, show's about to begin right here. Others would post printed playbills or broadsides. One of the first documented newspaper advertisements appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette on December 30th, 1742. At the sign of the Coach and Horses against the State House in Chestnut Street, Philadelphia, every evening at 7 o'clock precisely will be acted in several scenes an agreeable comedy or tragedy by changeable figures of two feet high. A sight of sea and ships, a merry dialogue of Punch and Joan, his wife, with several other pleasing entertainments. Towards the middle part of the 18th century, European shadow theater arrived in America and it became a popular form of entertainment. One of the more famous shadow puppet plays in the 18th and 19th centuries was The Broken Bridge. It came from France, and it was first performed in Boston in 1745. However, it was not written down until almost 100 years later. I need to get across the bridge today. How can I get across the bridge? Hmm. Well, you can do what the ducks do and swim. <laughs> Through advertisements, newspapers, and historic records, we are able to document the presence of puppetry in America throughout the 18th century. As a matter of fact, on November 16, 1776, George Washington made an entry in his account book that he spent 11 shillings, sixpence for a puppet show. Prior to the American Revolution, the comical tragedy of Punch and Joan, a tradition in Europe for well over a hundred years, found its way to America. The Punch character features a large hook nose and protruding chin. He is portrayed as a commoner, a great spokesman for liberty, 
who's constantly at odds with all authorities, including his wife, and the devil. Uh, Punch was always a hero of the common man. He had a rough language. He behaved in ways that are not proper in society and therefore served as a sort of release for those watching him. Uh, Punch and his wife, Judy, uh, would always play kissy face and uh, have a wonderful uh, love relationship, which would end up in an argument. Among jobs that Punch was always assigned to do was to babysit, and Punch didn't have much luck with babies either. Punch and Judy's shows during this period were strictly an adult entertainment. And although many stout religious groups found the shows offensive and immoral, Punch and Judy remained a popular form of entertainment in America well into the next century. During the 19th century, it was practicality and necessity, not artistic endeavors, that determined the role and form of puppetry in America. Itinerant puppeteers needed shows that could pack up quickly and be easily transported from town to town. Punch and Judy shows fit the bill and were commonly performed on street corners, at parks and church picnics. In the rural villages of America, a new kind of puppet appeared. It was called a planchette puppet or dancing jack. The puppet would come to life when the puppeteer tapped the board in time to music. It too was easy to transport. As the American population moved westward, itinerant puppeteers moved with the settlers. The typical itinerant puppet company was made up of a small family and perhaps one or two apprentices. One such family was the Lano family, who performed from the mountain villages of Virginia to the mining towns of California. In addition to Punch and Judy, their repertoire included biblical stories, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and William Tell. The Lano family, like other small family showmen, was the theater of the frontier. And although they had no long-lasting effect on the art of puppetry, the Lano family and other performers like them are important because they helped to perpetuate the art of puppetry in America. Puppet showmen at this time earned a meager living. It was a tough life. Many puppeteers found employment with circuses and fairs in the summer months. In the winter, they played indoors at dime museums among magicians, menageries, and sideshow freaks. These types of venues forced many puppeteers to change their acts from full-length dramatic productions to short variety acts where marionettes performed stunts and tricks. Also, because of their association with circuses and dime museums, puppet shows were now stereotyped as slapstick novelty acts and not considered a theatrical art form. Most stayed with the familiar Punch and Judy and trick marionette shows to meet the expectations and demands of the public. After the Civil War, a number of large marionette companies were imported from Europe. 